Uh, the panel is entitled The Color of Change, Racial Justice, Pub Public Policy, and Grassroots Activism in Obama's America. And I'll give a quick introduction for our three panelists, uh, three very distinguished panelists. Our first uh, presenter is uh, Callie Gross, who's Associate Professor of African and African Diaspora Studies and Associate Chair of African and African Diaspora Studies at uh, the University of Texas at Austin. Um, she has received numerous awards and fellowships. Uh, her second book, um, her first book is Colored Amazons, Crime, Violence, and Black Women in the City of Brotherly Love, 1880 to 1910, uh, which came out from Duke University Press and received several book prizes. And her second book is just hot off the presses, Hannah Mary Tabs and the Disembodied Torso, A Tale of Race, Sex, and Violence in America which was released in February 2016 by Oxford Woo! University Press. Uh, it's been getting great, great Thank reviews. You. It's been featured Thank on NPR you. and a number of um, uh, radio and television stations. And she does very, very innov innovative uh, work on um, race, gender, um, and the criminal justice system uh, historically. And has really been one of the um, uh, uh, trailblazers in opening up that field. There's all this new work on black women, and the criminal justice system going back to the 19th century to the present that, that Callie Gross's work has really um, been paradigmatic for. Um, then we're gonna have Brandon Terry, who's assistant professor African and African American studies and social studies uh, at Harvard University. Uh, and Brandon is one of the young, um, the young guns, one of the young brilliant uh, faculty, uh, not just at Harvard, but, but nationally. Uh, he earned his PhD uh, with University of Distinction in Political Science and African American Studies uh, from Yale University. Um, he got his bachelor's degree uh, from Harvard University. Um, uh, prior, to, uh, prior to Yale, he, he graduated, like I said, from Harvard, and he was a Michael uh, von Klemm Fellow at Corpus Christi College at the University of Oxford. I didn't know there's a Corpus Christi College at University of Oxford. That's right, Body of Christ, brother. Wow, <laughs> wow, jeez, man. He recently completed a term as a Junior Prize Fellow in the Center for History and Economics, where he is now a faculty um, associate. And he's working on a book on the civil rights movement uh, and really political theory and political ph philosophy of that civil rights period. And then finally, we have um, a dear friend and colleague, Dinah Ramey Berry, who's Associate Professor, Department of History, uh, the University of Texas at Austin. And I, I first met Dinah um, many years ago. I won't say how many years ago, but when I was, was young, not even finished with my um, dissertation at Arizona State University. So I must have been, I must have been 25 years old, and boy, was I, uh, I was more energetic then than I am now, I think, I um, which means people couldn't stand me. Um, um, but it was she was she was a young assistant professor. I saw her job talk, um, unbelievably brilliant. Uh, she received her PhD from um, UCLA, uh, where she worked with Brenda Stevenson. And um, uh, prior to earning her PhD there, she got her MA and her BA also from U UCLA. Her research focuses included the role of family, uh, gender economy and labor in the lives of slaves. Um, and she is the author of several books on uh, slavery and gender. Her upcoming work is The Price for Their Pound of Flesh, The Value of Human Chattel from Preconception to Postmortem is due uh, to be re released next year. And she's done um, groundbreaking work on, on, this, on this subject. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to this, very much looking forward to this, and I think we're gonna start with, um, with Callie. All right, thank you. Thanks, yeah. Thank you. Sorry about that. Well, good afternoon. So you know Uhuru is like a tough act to follow. Okay, I have to tell you all that I, th I think you're right, that Peniel put all the mean folks on the same panel together, okay? There'll be no slides. <laughs> There'll be no like energetic walking around, you know, none of that. Um, I couldn't figure out how to work out Beyonce's video formation into my talk. <laughs> so it's a wrap on that. Um, 
But that said, I do want to take a minute just to thank Peniel Joseph and the LBJ School and your Center for Race and Democracy for this opportunity. I'm actually really eager to be in conversation with folks here today, um, particularly those of you who are directly engaged in policy making. Um, I'm a you know, historian by training, so I'm, I'm very excited for, for the exchange. Um, so I called my comments today Black Her Stories of State Violence. Um, now, some months ago, I was approached by The Root. This is an online uh, periodical that concentrates on a lot of black political issues. I was approached by The Root to sort of participate in this monthly series that they're doing on Obama's legacy in his last term. And so my piece was called The Deadening of Blackness in the Age of Obama. And it concentrated on three themes that I'm interested in exploring here today. So my comments are going to sort of focus on these three areas. One, I'm interested in sort of briefly identifying what I think are one of the chief sort of paradoxes of his presidency with respect to race for black people. It sounds like some folks touched on this yesterday. Um, and I also want to call attention to what I see are some alarming uh, historical parallels with respect to increased black political representation and increased anti-black state violence. Uh, and then, and this is going to be the bulk of my conversation, I'm going to sort of look at and consider how state violence against black women is rooted in a much longer history of, biased, uh, of a biased, politicized politics of protection. And so I'm exploring this history with an eye toward the future, and I'm interested in having this dialogue about how we might sort of make history speak even more effectively to assist, I think, in finding solutions for a lot of these issues today. So with respect to the paradox of, of this presidency, I think black voters, especially uh, black women like me, overwhelmingly supported Barack Obama for president, right? Certainly, as a self-identified African American, his candidacy was historic, but he also really won our vote because he professed an agenda that I think we believe would be good for the nation as a whole. And I think like many folks, I, I certainly bought into change, right? Definitely wanted serious radical change. Uh, but at the same time, I think most of us in the black community also instinctively acquiesced to this sort of Faustian-like bargain, right? We all had kind of accepted that President Obama cannot be held accountable to sort of the unique concerns of black voters, right, lest he be accused of racial favoritism and thusly not reelected, right? But despite these sort of concerns, despite his sort of foregoing, despite foregoing concerns unique to black communities, we're nonetheless on the front lines when it comes to the sort of virulent racist backlash on his presidency, right? And it seems that the hits are sort of coming from every conceivable angle. So affirmative actions back in the Supreme Court, voting rights have been gutted, and we've learned in some of the most painful ways possible that for far too many law enforcement officers, uh, the policy is to shoot first and ask questions later where black lives are concerned. And so for me, there, there are some troubling kind of parallels to the sort of epidemic of lynching that plagued the nation during and after Reconstruction. Uh, you know, after emancipation, for a little less than a decade, African American men got to exercise many key aspects of citizenship, particularly the right to vote. And so much so that, as many have noted, there were sort of more black congressmen in the 19th century than there were in the 21st when Obama ran for the presidency, right? Um, but those sort of civil and political gains were not without challenges, right? The racist backlash is severe. So not only is this era marked by, uh, marked by black citizenship, but it also gave birth to a number of sort of white hate groups like the Ku Klux Klan, which we know survives to this day. And their retribution for black voters and other sort of uppity Negroes who failed to adhere to racist notions of place were bloody assaults in a spate of racist lynchings, right? Blacks then, um, uh, back then, right, these sort of racists circulated postcards about these unlawful killings, right? Some of which were orchestrated by angry white mobs, many with the consent of, if not carried out, by white police. But in the age of Obama, it seems now, right, we have, we have the videos, right? Video footage depicting once living, breathing black women and men and children fatally cut down in an instant by, black, by police officers. Right in the past, the narrative used to justify the killing of unarmed black men was that black men rape white women. 
right? Those women and children who were also victims of lynching usually met their ends because they supposedly aided and abetted uh, those accused black men or had themselves somehow affronted whites, which at the time, you know, was cause for death. For black women especially, many ended up being lynched fending off sexual assault, sometimes uh, in police custody. Now, whatever the precise circumstances, blacks' feel, failure to adhere to these sort of strictures of white supremacy kind of meant death. This is a rhetoric. You stepped out of line. This was cause for your death. Now the narrative goes something like this. You know what the narrative is for the shooters? But aren't black folks? Right? They feared for their safety. Right? That's the narrative now. But our time hasn't just witnessed a resurgence of racial tyrannies of old, right? It's also marked by the emergence of new social movements, certainly Black Lives Matter and its black feminist counterparts say her name, right? This is a movement aimed at getting recognition and justice for black women and girls who have also been victims of anti-black state violence. Now, in process, Say Her Name has begun to call attention to black women's disproportionate rate of incarceration, higher instances of poverty, and also the ways that despite sort of overwhelming support of the Obama presidency, how little sort of reward black women have reaped as a voting constituency. So this movement has opened up a space to really consider more broadly how black womanhood has historically collided with the criminal justice system. So now you know, the historian in me, Right, cannot help but to point out that the injustices against black women like Marissa Alexander, everyone knows who Marissa Alexander is? It's a battered woman who got initially sentenced to 20 years for the warning shot, same state where George Zimmerman was acquitted for shooting Trayvon Martin. Um, Sandra Bland, right, a tragedy here in our own state. And those black victims in the Daniel Holtzclaw case, right, the 12 black women and one black child who were assaulted by a serial rapist ex-police officer. Okay. So all these cases point to both the ongoing challenges um, to obtain and enjoy sort of equitable justice, at the same time that they highlight, I think, this history of biased justice that black women have faced in the United States, right? And which has been sort of punctuated by a combination of things, right? A lack of protection and almost negligible access to due process of law at the same time that black women have been and remain subject to some of the harshest penalties in the legal system, right? So black women don't get access to justice or protection, but when something goes wrong, we get hit the hardest. Um, and so I want to take a minute to talk about state violence in black women's history. I'm going to go way back, but I promise I'm going to be fast. All right, <laughs> plus I know she got the card to make me go. All right, so you know, so statutes governing enslavement and the treatment of African descended women in particular subjected black women to violence and sexual exploitation at the same time that it foments their criminalization. So 17th and 18th century laws especially jeopardized black womanhood, from the decree that enslaved women's children would also be enslaved to rape laws that excluded the sexual assault of black women and girls. So statutes like these left black women vulnerable to sexual violence, particularly given that masters would profit from any viable pregnancies. Moreover, most whites held black women responsible for their victimization, right, and promoted stereotypes about their lasciviousness, right, as one Alabama planter opined, quote, he did not know more than one Negro woman he could suppose to be chaste. So yet when black women physically resisted and attacked abusers, um, they would be the ones subject to severe punishment from the legal system that had failed to protect them. So these dynamics coalesce in profoundly detrimental ways as black women in the justice system combat sort of widespread beliefs about their immorality and inherent criminality, right? These impact, the impact of these phenomena becomes especially visible through the examination of black women's historical rates of incarceration. So if we begin even with the nation's first penitentiary, this is in 1790, Walnut Street Prison, which comprised a jail and penitentiary house uh, in Philadelphia, follows the state's gradual, the 1780 Act for the Gradual Abolition of Slavery. So once we have this, this legislation on the books that black people are going to be freed, we get this more robust sort of criminal justice system equipped with the first penitentiary. Right? And it, you know, the fear about black freedom, together with this sort of legislative emphasis on punishing crimes against property, quickly leads to blacks' disproportionate confinement. 
And so in Philadelphia and eventually in much of the country, black women are more disproportionately represented in prison than black men. And so although African Americans in the cities uh, were less than 20% of the city's population, you have African American women accounting for half of all female prisoners. You have black men accounting for roughly 30% of all male prisoners. Okay, and so by virtue of working in white homes as domestics, often the only uh, employment available to them, black women are especially susceptible to larceny charges, right? Further, sort of all white juries tend to favor the word of their white accusers rather than that of impoverished black servants. Um, and so these underlying forces contributed to African Americans' increased rates of incarceration and black women especially who go before Philadelphia courts find themselves convicted more than any other group in the city. Okay, so after the sort of national abolition of slavery, newly freed black men and women experienced similar patterns of imprisonment in the South. So for example, the black population accounts for roughly 30%, right, of the total Southern population between 1880 and 1920. African American men accounted for just over 70% of male prisoners in the late 19th century. Right, 70%. African American women accounted for 86% of female prisoners. Likewise, in the Midwest in the 1880s, black women represented 29% of female prisoners, while black men accounted for 12% of the males. At that time, they were roughly 2% of the population. Okay, so though their numbers in broader population essentially hold steady, these sort of patterns. Uh, continue throughout the 19th century, I'm sorry, th and into the early 20th century, so that by 1923, even though African Americans are still only 2.3% of the general population, they account for 20% of all state prisoners. By the 1960s, for felony convictions, those numbers climbed to nearly 50% for black men and 70% for women. Yet black women and men made just over 10% of the Illinois population. So in the late 20th century as well, is in the early part of the 21st, these sort of harsh anti-drug policies, such as the Rockefeller drug laws, negatively impacted African American women. Uh, and their imprisonment sort of percentage for drug-related offenses is actually twice that of black men. And so black women's experience of justice then and now sort of punctuated by these kind of you know, longer prison sentences, violence and sexual assault both in custody and outside. And so there's this matrix of racism and sexual violence that I think is dog black women, um, that's, that has dog black women is central to black women's victimization and criminalization. And these remain sort of major impediments to the exercise of full rights of citizenship. So this is certainly what Say Her Name is rooted in, but also this movement has expressed real frustration with not just, again, that anti-black state violence, but also with the sort of lack of federal response to these unique challenges faced by black women. And so some of the things, I'd kind of like to close with a couple of, a few questions and sort of a final summation. And my questions are these. Um, one of the things I'm interested in, I hope we have time to talk about it, is how might we use sort of this history to help implement policies that actually arrest black women's disproportionate incarceration, right? And if we simply can't find uses for it, what other areas might historians study to sort of support progressive social movements that seek to sort of remedy mass incarceration and its vicissitudes? And I guess finally this. You know, many believe that it's unfair and or unrealistic to expect Obama to intervene more directly than he already has, right, on matters of race, policing, and mass incarceration. I would be really interested to hear where folks in this room sort of stand on that issue and those questions. Uh, I can tell you, I personally have struggled with being grateful to have witnessed the first black president in my lifetime. Uh, and also my frustration with the halting ways that he and his administration have handled the crises that Black Lives Matter and Say Her Name now seek to address. And so as I sort of stated at the start, I'm very interested in this dialogue because I want to help be a part of any research or scholarship that aims to create policies designed to upend the historical and contemporary forces that have pushed black women to the margins of justice and in that citizenship and democracy. Thank you for your time. All right. Um, first off, I'd like to thank uh, Peniel Joseph, 
for his kind invitation and for putting all of us together. I've made a lot of new connections and, and really, really inspiring work all throughout the conference. I've been to a lot of conferences, very few as inspiring as this one. Uh, and you know, I want to thank the University of Texas in part for you know, hiring Peniel and giving him this center because I think it's really, really crucial and critical, particularly in a public policy uh, world and a political science world, which I come from, that is, is, is quite weak on these issues and is particularly weak on being historically informed about the uh, origins and, and contours of many of these social problems and needs to devote a lot more resources to solving them. So uh, thank you. Um, I wanted to, to deliver my remarks today in the spirit of James Baldwin's indispensable 1961 essay, uh, The Dangerous Road Before Martin Luther King. Um, I wanna pursue a similar set of reflections about the dangerous road before Black Lives Matter. Uh, undoubtedly, we are again in a period of what Baldwin called a uh, time of critical self-examination about the enduring and expansive force of racialized domination in our society uh, this time provoked by the heroic efforts of those organizing under the sign of Black Lives Matter. Yet as Baldwin suggests, this endeavor inevitably confronts us with the serious responsibility of reassessing our relation to the past, as well as dealing with the signs and portents heralding a possible future that we cannot abide. So in what remains of my time, I wanna focus on three broad themes that sit at the crux of this dilemma. The first is the aesthetic and ethical dimensions of protest. Uh, the second are the class dynamics of the Black Lives Matter movement. And the third are the urban crises of violence and municipal government that confront them as they, they attempt to translate their gains on the movement level into public policy. Uh, all of these are rooted in a political theory approach which is really concerned at the last instance with the reinvigoration of the imagination. Uh, I wanted to also speak about the political and philosophical challenge the Obama administration represents to black insurgency, but hopefully we can discuss that in the question and answer. Um, with perhaps the exception of the project of building up a digital black counter public sphere, uh, the central form of political action that Black Lives Matter has um, relied upon is protest. Unfortunately, the debates around this protest have thus far been dominated by narrow instrumentalism and moralism chiding Black Lives Matter for unclear demands and violating norms of civility. These debates show a remarkable inability to get beyond tactical questions narrowly conceived to the more fundamental political philosophic questions of protest. How do we capture the limited attention of the polity? What modes of attention, participation, and response do we want to elicit from our fellow citizens and why? What kinds of political subjects, both actors and spectators, do we want to help form with our actions? And what claims, what normative arguments justify our actions and our decision making? In asking these questions, we are, I think, returning to the aesthetic and ethical dimensions of protest. We can start to ask hard questions about what precisely is drawing our sustained attention to certain Black Lives Matter protests over others. To what degree does the aesthetic force of Black Lives Matter depend upon uh, their trafficking in tropes of a, of a nostalgia for black militancy? How much does it turn on the shock for some audiences of black queer self-assertion or the transgression of respectability politics? How much does our attention to something like the uprising in Ferguson depend on a carnivalesque titillation of inverting hierarchies of violence and power with disruption? Uh, I ask these things because these forms of affect may not be able to sustain a prolonged attention at the causes and sources of black disadvantage. These questions are not simply sociological, but political. So far, a movement highly reliant on the spectacle of protest has been unable to generate sustained capacity for its core form of political action without being parasitic on high profile incidents of police violence that can be described as racist. Uh, the aesthetic lens helps us reopen the question of what repertoires of, of protest could somehow transcend that kind of reliance? Um, and also, how could it transcend a narrow policy discourse around police shootings, important as they are, to articulate dissent against a wide range of slow-moving institutional processes that produce harm and cumulative disadvantage for black and poor communities? Um, so I'm thinking of things here like mass incarceration and also environmental uh, pollution. So Flint, for instance, which we've talked a lot 
about a lot today, has 4.9% of its kids testing positive for elevated lead levels, but the west side of Detroit has 20% of its kids testing um, at elevated levels of lead poisoning. So in my essay uh, that I wrote for this magazine, The Point, called After Ferguson, I suggested that placing the concept of pedagogy at the center of our analyses of protest is one way of thinking through the problem of rendering these processes more visible. Uh, if we are attuned to protest possible educative and deliberative dimensions, we can see how enduringly powerful protests actually render complex injustices sensible and intelligible for the public and compel us to re-describe our society and re-thematize our notions of injustice. There's an unfortunate uh, sense in which this lesson, which is central to the history of black freedom struggles, has been forgotten, uh, in part through the particular shape of our narratives, but also through the victory of some of these movements. We've forgotten just how mundane and systematic Jim Crow was and how it drew so much of its normative force from appeals uh, to public order to sharp distinctions between the public and the private, and to the ethical weight of tradition. If we foreground the pedagogical, we can start to reveal how civil rights movement protest can be understood as shattering this normative order through redescription and refounding. Sit-ins were not simply dissent. They were world historical claims against the existing public-private distinction that access to the commercial spaces of society on egalitarian grounds is integral to citizenship in modern society. Direct action protests in Birmingham are not simply disruption, they were a trenchant critique of the discourses of public order and public safety as prone to ideological manipulation in order to protect hierarchy. The current day's uh, predatory expropriation of wealth from black citizens in St. Louis County and Washington, D.C., or the environmental racism of Flint and Baltimore demands this sort of pedagogical political intervention as well to reveal these things to the public. Uh, the last thing I want to say on this subtopic is that thinking through the aesthetic and pedagogical dimensions of protest opens up the question of politics beyond the narrow questions of demands and existing constituencies to a more foundational question of how political practices produce kinds of human subjects and kinds of affective emotional responses that are inextricable from the question of refounding our society on new and more egalitarian ideals. I think that the debates around the politics of respectability are an inchoate recognition of the fact that forms of political action we embrace entail thick descriptions of, of who is and who is not a citizen and what modes of comportment, emotion, and speech are acceptable in the public sphere. However, this has unfortunately led to a position widely held among Black Lives Matter activists that is largely critical and not reconstructive. It's not enough to object to the ways in which black rage or the liberties of those on the margins of black communities are constrained and luxuriate in the removal of those constraints. We must still ask very hard questions about how various forms of protest and political speech entail certain justifications or elicit forms of emotional response that we might not endorse upon considered reflection as foundations for a new social order. One of the real tragedies about the dismissal of folks like Audre Lorde, Martin Luther King, Stokely Carmichael, and James Baldwin as serious political thinkers is that they, they thought quite incisively about this version of the relation between means and ends in politics. Do our political actions create the possibility for overcoming distrust and resentment, or do they foreclose it? Do they draw their constituency from pity or sympathy or from egalitarian solidarity? Can a movement to refound the polity be, laced on, be based on liberal notions of duty, responsibility, and freedom, or do they need a more democratic ethos of sacrifice and aspiration to common purpose? Part of the difficulty that Black Lives Matter has had in responding to these sorts of questions stems from a dynamic which has severely obscured the movement's politics and fault lines, namely its class composition. There's an unfortunate failure, especially among intellectuals, to acknowledge and appreciate the class dynamics of BLM and identify these forces as part of why there's been such difficulty in moving outward from police violence and reform to issues of political economy and government, which are the institutional arenas for white supremacy and entrenched domination. It is my sense that the organizational logic of most of the BLM organizations we've studied, with the exception of the Ferguson groups, are that they are especially dependent on a primarily middle-class constituency and an appeal to racial solidarity. This solidarity is real, but it's thinner than I think we care to acknowledge. 
It's built on a sense of shared vulnerability to episodic police and vigilante violence. The real brunt, however, of systemic police violence and expropriation and the public health and economic implications of the carceral state fall primarily on the black poor. The narrative that links the black Wall Street executive who gets pulled over uh, to the residents of Ferguson and a shared susceptibility to police violence has some truth to it, but it ignores the more dangerous and formative logic of neoliberalism and state violence. The police enforced expropriation of black wealth, property, labor, and bodies have become a logical state imperative for, for municipalities that are battered by coercive practices of municipal debt lending, corporate tax evasion, and the conservative assault on state capacity. Indeed, part of why many African Americans are shot by the police is because social services in these communities have been so eviscerated that the police, who are spared by these cuts and make up astronomical portions of municipal budgets, have become de facto social service providers uh, who use the hammer of state violence to beat all sorts of nails, whether they're truancy, intimate partner violence, familial discord, or mental illness. A frame that relies solely on race or thinly conceived racial solidarity ends up exaggerating the extent to which black elites are subjected to these sorts of practices, and more importantly, the ways in which these practices overflow racial boundaries and affect communities that are not black as well. My concern is that we don't want the energy of the movement to be limited to the most narrow range of shared interest among blacks uh, and not attend to the unique harms visited upon the least advantaged who are disproportionately but not entirely African American. I think you see instances of this when we move too quickly uh, to make false equivalences between the complex tangle of problems you see in something like the Ferguson Report and questions of equity and access on college campuses and Hollywood. We have to be careful about collapsing our analyses and solutions to these problems under abstractions like white supremacy and diversity uh, that ignore the class dynamics of work. There, there are ways to use those concepts, but they have to be attentive to the ways in which class and gender and sexuality um, you know, inter, intertwine with them. Heroically overcoming the complex of problems in a place like Ferguson or Baltimore will demand the organization of working class and poor people, especially in black communities, along with potential allies in labor, civil libertarian groups, migrant rights groups, feminist groups, and other uh, civil society organizations. This kind of work is extremely difficult and will involve hard conversations and personal sacrifice to enact cultural transformation on issues of gender and sexuality that this movement has rightly emphasized. It strikes me, however, that in dealing with questions that have such an intractable local and public policy-based component, you will not gain major reforms without enduring political organizations, constituencies, and points of leverage to influence not just debate, but policy formation and enforcement over time. For all of the SNCC iconography that dominates the Black Lives Matter moment, it seems that only a few organizations like Hands Up United and BYP 100 have made serious organizational commitments to SNCC-inspired organizing models. I want to end with two quick concerns about government and Black Lives Matter that flow from these questions about political organizing. The first is that in the wake of Ferguson, many protesters aim to install black elected officials and black administrators as a solution to these problems. This is undeniably important, but as Baltimore shows, we should be aware of the limits of this approach so that our political responses don't get trapped within them. Black elected officials in majority black cities, towns, and neighborhoods are severely hemmed in by the racialized borders that cut across American metropolises and which give legal authority to what is sociologically best characterized as racial paranoia and opportunity hoarding in the domains of tax revenue and education. The limited political power of cities leaves them with few resources to beat back many of the other great challenges of municipal government in a neoliberal age. Corporations place coercive pressure on elected officials, holding them hostage for more favorable tax packages. And the pathologies of public sector labor unions have left cities on the hook for billions in financial outlays. Strapped for revenue, they fall victim to the law of privatization, which allows companies to turn state functions like tax and fee collection into avenues for real estate and revenue expropriation 
and allows them to suppress collective bargaining altogether. Or even worse, hostile state governments, which are nearly always more conservative and always whiter than these cities, subject these municipalities to anti-democratic measures in the name of financial emergency, including the appointment of emergency managers, state takeovers of public schools, and things of the sort. So these are the challenges awaiting someone like DeRay McKesson as he, uh, as he uh, goes to run for mayor of a city like Baltimore and hands up, which has gotten really involved in Ferguson politics. The second question and the, and the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll talk about is, is crime. Uh, crime, especially street violence, represents a fundamental challenge to the political philosophy of Black Lives Matter, in part because its aspiration to refound the polity with an egalitarian and emancipatory conception of public safety has to deal with the problem of severe intractable violence and a resurgent drug epidemic. After years of decline, Baltimore's homicides this past year reached 344, which is their highest per capita total in recorded history. Uh, Chicago has already had 16 homicides in this month alone. Right now, as we speak, the criminal justice reform bill that was supposed to release a number of offenders and alleviate mass incarceration is being gutted by Republican senators who are waving around these numbers. These developments in the entrenched position of police unions and their allies suggest a world in which public safety in black communities cannot be achieved without huge carceral rates, steady police violence, and unassailable police authority. One of the most important things about Black Lives Matter is that they've challenged the philosophical and sociological presuppositions of these claims and gestured toward a society where this is not the case. Compelling solutions and analyses of these problems are critical for securing black working class allegiances uh, and building up the capacity of BLM organizations. It's, it's Black Lives Matter's critique that allows us to return with historians, hopefully, to rethink questions like, what are the police for? What justifies punishment? Who is the public and what kind of safety are we most interested in securing? So, you know, we need to open up our political imagination to turn away from this crime control question to radically rethink public safety. And I think that's one of the really big uh, initiatives of BLM. And it's, uh, the question is, can we develop the capacity and organizational infrastructure to really make progress on those questions? Thank you. Good afternoon. I want to echo my panelists and thank Peniel Joseph for organizing this conference and inviting us to speak. And I thank the LBJ um, program here on the campus for allowing this forum and the new center. So um, just like my other panelists, my remarks are going to be about coming from the perspective of slavery, which is my area of research. And I'm hopefully going to show some images that will start um, help us generate a conversation afterwards so we can talk about some of these connections, OK? So the title of my talk is A Public Spectacle of Back Black Death, Activism, and the Backlash of Civil Rights. Last summer, a black woman was pulled over by the police in Houston. The officer thought she had drugs on her, so he asked her to step out the, of her vehicle. After tearing up her car, and finding nothing, he ordered a quote unquote cavity search on her body. She refused and was pinned down by the police officer, asked to lift up her skirt and allow a female officer to place her hand in the woman's vagina and search for a quote unquote hidden drugs. This woman was Sarnisa Corley. Nearly 200 years ago, um, an enslaved mother told many folks, her daughter, don't let nobody bother your principal. The story goes like this. Minnie's mother had been, beat, been beaten and sexually harassed by her owner. Um, and she refused to have sex with him. So she told her, her, mother, her, she told her daughter why she was constantly in this physical alter, altercation with her enslaver. And she says that she ref, her mother refused to um, have sex with this man. And she said, quote, she refused to be his wife. Many folks learned from her mother and other enslaved women how to protect themselves from the ill treatment of white male authority. A female wet nurse, who also had the task of fanning flies off of her enslaved child that she nursed, um, not her, excuse me, the white child that she nursed, 
woke up one day after she fell asleep fanning him. She woke up to him beating her. This was like a 12-year-old boy or so. And he said, and she says to him, you know, I raised you on these breasts. And she was so offended by him whipping her and beating her because she fell asleep. So she literally took off on the plantation cow named Dolly. And they said that Dolly and the woman were never seen again. So there's a moment that people get where they can't take anymore, where enough is enough and where they fight back in ways that maybe seem unimaginable to us, but also I think have some res resonance to some of the issues that we're seeing today. Now I want to return to Sharnisa Corley for a minute because she too tried to prevent somebody from bothering her principal and was later violated on the side of the road at a Texaco gas station um, by a female officer. Now I begin my remarks with these images because today's activism has strong ties to the history of slavery. We are in a moment, and I've, I've said this over and over again in my classes for the last you know, year and a half or so, and I was happy to hear uh, Dr. Williams say this yesterday, that this is a, a Black Lives moment, um, and we're not sure what kind of movement it evolves into, um, but we are in a moment, and I would argue that um, we're, we're in this moment, and part of this moment is the backlash of activism for civil rights. And for me, part of this is, is looking at the issue of black death, which is so consumed as part of this public spectacle. It's a public spectacle that I believe has been around for a while, and it has to do and is directly linked with civil rights, and it has its antecedents in slavery. So I believe we have much to learn from this history. Now, body cavity searches occurred on plantations daily, at market centers, on the auction block, and in the privacy of people's homes. This was not a new phenomenon. Black people were literally poked, fondled, prodded, felt up on, etc. It was part of public culture of slave auctions that took place in the valuation of black lives. So this is just an image here of an inspection before slaves were put on a ship. And this, this type of brutality in public, um, public viewing showed even on the slave ships. They were punished on slave ships for not eating, for resisting, for choosing not to live or not respond or not go to the, the planter's cabin um, that night the, or the, the ship captain's cabin. And so you see that even on the slave ship, abolitionists used the literature to show the torture that was publicly uh, meted out. They showed this, they used this literature to fight against the, the transatlantic slave trade. I also want to call our attention to the public nature again. We're talking about making public policy, but here we have a public slave auction with a large um, group of people there. These auctions were often held in convention halls and downtown centers where um, black bodies were put on, on pedestals. And as I mentioned, the inspection occurred. There are occasions where some of these inspections happen behind a closed door, behind a screen. Um, and those were the quote unquote better occasions if there are such. Um, where they had some protection of their, of their bodies from a larger viewing public. But there's just this senseless violence that, happens, violence that happens in these settings. As I mentioned, the auction houses were in the center of town. Um, they advertised them openly. as a, For sale in a public auction was visible and viewable for all. You knew where to go if you were going to purchase slaves or buy them. And also we find that the other, the other connection I like to make here with the history of slavery is when African-Americans or Afri people of African descent fought against slavery, for instance, the Nat Turner Rebellion, this is the slide that talks about the Horde massacre in Virginia, individuals are then executed, and these executions are public executions, very similar to the way uh, we will see, we'll later see lynchings, okay? So there's a public execution for a crime that they committed or allegedly committed. And I see this connection here with, with the ways in which people interpret these events. We have advertisements of black bodies being put on sale, um, them sh showing their bodies, uh, their wounds, their scars, um, being, being cleaned up also, greased up, cleaned up, clothed up like the ones on the far right and the slaves waiting for sale. This is a very famous painting. Um, our provost wrote a book about our, our incoming provost wrote a book called Slaves Waiting for Sale and it deals with this particular photograph on the far right, you see? So what I would argue is that hangings during slavery um, were sentences, as I mentioned, to different crimes. But that was also, to me, still an example of the spectacle of, of black death that I think we've, we seem a little distracted with, from my perspective. And so one of the things that I thought about is 
what happens when we look at these large-scale executions? These are not movements that are just involving African Americans and African American supporting. These are also interracial movements, as some of my other panelists said. We have people like John Brown, who was willing to die for the freedom of African American slaves. He was also put on the gallows and hung, you know, hung in front of a large artillery of people, bystanders, and guests, and so forth. And also hung that was the first person that was killed in the Harper's Ferry raid was Dangerfield Newby. Um, his body was then um, thrown into a hog pen, and he was completely like shredded and eaten alive, practically. And they buried him in a shallow grave, but later in, in about 18, I think it was 1899, he was reinterred with a number of other, the, the followers that were involved in the, net, in the John Brown raid, and they gave him a proper burial um, in New Elba, New York, where John Brown's body is currently buried. So there's some kind of reclamation, there's sort of thinking about a way of of uh, atoning for for the the dis disturbing death that he had and the, the, the literature that we can read about how he was torn up. And they said that one hog went up to him and when they got near his face, it ran off. And so they were just, you know, they talked about what people ate that winter. There was one quote in a local magazine that said, in a local um, newspaper that said, people were really leery of the soup that they had that winter because they weren't sure if it was full of uh, parts of Dangerfield Newby's body. I mean, the fact that that even made it to a newspaper, to me, is pretty interesting. But this, again, this public nature. Um, one of the things that I also want to show that after we get out of slavery, we shift into the public spectacle of black death in the form of lynching and the large audiences. Um, I was really torn um, about what I was going to talk about today because I didn't want to, I'm trying not to show the black bodies as much. I know I showed a few. But I didn't want to continue that, that sort of um, the voyeuristic view that we all have when we're looking at this. And one of the things that's disturbed me about this moment that we're in is that I feel like slavery rec represented the legal playground um, of black dehumanization. It was legal to do what they did. Emancipation and reconstruction became the stage. And I would argue that today we're in a full-fledged theater production of black death. And we're seeing it you know, every day on television. And that reminded me of um, when I think about some of the ways that we visualize this. Um, the picture on the left is a very famous Im uh, photograph or sketch of the belly of a slave ship and how people were placed on a slave ship in spoon fashion. Um, I saw over and over again on the news, um, in newspapers, online resources, you know, all these autopsy photos. And it reminded me of the same image of the slave ship. And autopsy photos, and I, there's a m many others, and I decided not to show them, but just showing where the bodies were mutilated. And I feel like this is similar to the same type of mutilation we saw in lynching and the same type that we saw in enslavement when people were punished. I decided not to show the tweet that Zimmerman post. He posted a tweet that had a picture. I was actually surprised at how many pictures I saw uh, preparing for this particular talk of, I had never seen Trayvon Martin's body. Um, and I, had, I, didn't, I wasn't trying to witness it, but I saw it. And um, I saw the first time I saw it was in a tweet from Zimmerman, that, and then he retweeted it. Twitter ended up taking it down, thank goodness. But the fact that it's out there, and that it was publicly circulated, and that people shared it and reshared it, to me is problematic. But it also just falls in line to this history of this public spectacle of black death. Um, Renisha, McBride, Renisha McBride's autopsy photos, um, her photo, you can't even see practically half of her face because there were so many bullets that went into that one side of her eye that it's like, you know, a gash. It's like, a, I didn't even want to bother to show it. And then also, the thing that really made me think about how I wanted to, to make these connections was the day that I, when Laquan McDonald, when they talked about releasing his police video, they hyped that up on CNN for at least three hours before releasing it. And they talked about how we waited all this time, we're not gonna show it. You know, we waited all this time before we're gonna show it, but we wanna prepare you, we're gonna get the troops out there, we wanna make sure people don't riot. All this sort of setup, right? Then they showed it, and showed it, and showed it, and showed it, and looped it. I mean, then for the next week, every time I turn on the news, I would watch a segment where they're talking about it, but they would show his death, like literally five or six times within that one setting. And it was just over and over and over again. And that just reminded me, like, we're in this stage, in this theater. And what does this mean? That is this the modern lynching? You know, is, is police brutality and violence against black bodies, is this modern lynching? And, and I, I'm happy to see so many people against it and that we have a movement and people that are fighting 
against this, um, these atrocities. So making connections for me, historically, to someone like Amy Spain, who fought for her civil rights when she found out that um, there was a major civil war happening in Darlington. You know, she knew about the Civil War, and she decided to run away and try to break free. And her owner was upset with her and captured her just a month before the war ended. And they did a public hanging of her. It's her on the left. We also have countless unnamed black women victims of lynching. So we still don't know their names. A lot of us know about Laura Nelson. And we've seen that image with her and her son. But we don't really know all the names of other black women that were lynched. And then I have Sandra Blonde here only because now I think suicide is becoming the, the cover story for what might have been a lynching. It's just that we don't have cameras to prove what happened. So I would just make that something to think about. Um, and I want to close with um, an image again of Sharnisa Corley talking about her victimization. Fannie Lou Hamer, for those of you that know or may not know, she was also victimized while she was in police custody. And um, Celia, a slave, a 14-year-old slave girl who was uh, raped by her owner on the way back from the auction. So this history is not necessarily new. And I, when I think about um, some of the remarks from yesterday, and one of the questions was, so what now? What do we do? You know, we can go over these recanting, and we can talk about this history. But what do we do with this? How do we? What do we? How can we? How can we learn and move beyond this? And one of the things I thought about is like, how do we value lives, and how can we show our way? How can we show how we value them? We honor them, and we tell about them. We can remember them and show pictures of them, and we can write them into history books and hopefully into public policy. Activism, in my opinion, begins with listening to people's stories, acknowledging them, and then atoning for injustices committed against them. It is my hope that The Color of Change, the title of this panel, involves a movement of people we celebrate, we celebrate their lives and honor them, both black and brown and all other colors, men and women, who have fallen to the public spectacle of black death. Thank you. All right, before I open it up, I want to um, just put out a question uh, and comment. That was one, let, let's give them a round of applause. That was great. That was great. That was great. So we're talking about, um, this is great because uh, it's funny because uh, uh, Brandon had said that um, this, is, this is the mean panel. <laughs> this is the mean panel. Uh, no, this is, this is a sobering panel. And I think that um, this, is, this is unbelievably uh, important because uh, we, we, we had a, a group of panelists who really talked about this idea of grassroots activism, racial justice, public policy um, in very, very interesting ways. And I think very unique ways and over, overlapping and intersecting ways. Um, Callie Gross, uh, you talked about um, black women um, and their disproportionate incarceration. One thing I thought was very interesting, and I know this from your work, is the fact that in Philadelphia and in other places, even in the 19th century, and even up into the present, there are areas where black women are, are disproportionately incarcerated. I'd like to ask you about, um, um, in, in, terms of, in terms of policy, what are ways and measures um, at the federal and the state local level that could be done to ameliorate that? Because I think one of the things that you're talking about is now in popular cu uh, culture, through the television show Orange is the New Black. And the, the writer of that um, has discussed the black women she met in prison and has also actually concurred with what you're saying that what she went to prison for, which was um, uh, drug trafficking, money laundering, how she met and encountered a bunch of Latino and black women who were incarcerated but who were gonna spend more time in prison for doing less than what she had done. And she, that was the first time, she, the writer uh, is, is, was white, middle class. That was the first time she encountered that, and she's become a big outspoken advocate mm -hmm. for reforming the criminal justice system. So I want to ask you about that. And, and, and Brandon, you talked about Black Lives Matter in very interesting ways, because I think you're taking them, which, which I appreciate, seriously as, as um, a political movement mm -hmm. and, and thinking about how. Um, um, they can transform our conceptions of citizenship, what's allowable protest, but also in a bigger radical way, um, how do we structurally dismantle that which is oppressing um, all of us, but especially these activists? 
and how do we go beyond the criminal justice system? Uh, one of the things I've argued is criminal justice system is a gateway to all these different forms of oppression. I'd like to ask you, in terms of um, Black Lives Matter, what do you think in terms of, you talked about how the civil rights movement really upended the way in which we think about uh, forms of not just protest, but safety, security, citizenship, the polity. Um, one, I agree with you. I think Black Lives Matter already has done that. How can we translate that into policy? And certainly, you said the Ferguson movement is doing so, but others are not. And if not, why not? You know, is that, is that do they have sort of a naive conception about politics, even as they're doing something incredibly complex? So I want to ask you that. And finally, Dinah, you know, the spectacle of black death. I, I think that was brilliant, and I, I, I agree and concur. And I remember in uh, graduate school finding out about the number of lynching and the, lin the postcards. Mm -hmm. And the Guggenheim had a, 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 a lynching um, uh, viewing, a lynching um, a show in around 2005. Mm -hmm. But it showed postcards from lynching. And one of the interesting things uh, with the scholarship is that there were sundown towns. There were all the, and sundown towns, for people who need context, were places where if black people were caught when the sun was down, you'd be dead. Um, but what was interesting about the lynchings, and this goes to what Dinah was talking about, is that postcards from lynching were hugely popular in the late 19th and early 20th century, like unbelievably. They were, they were like bestsellers like Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. And people don't want to claim that or own that. People are just like, well, well, what does that mean? Well, it means a lot in terms of us, America, its institutions. It says a whole lot about us. And I wanted to ask you, when you think about the present, and how these, these images and spectacles of black death have gone viral, mm -hmm. do you think that's a good or bad thing? Is it, is it the same as the voyeurism of looking at postcards of lynching? Which I do think is, is voyeuristic, but at the same time, I also think there's an educational component. We need to see it. Mm -hmm. I agree with you about Laquan McDonald. I thought CNN was... was, was uh, Over the top. Yeah, <laughs> it should be ashamed of itself. Mm -hmm. um, um, but what do you think in terms of... You know, Sandra Bland, all these different things. That the, um, I'm losing uh, Walter Scott, his, mm -hmm. who was shot in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. So many that we've yeah. seen, and they've all gone viral. Mm -hmm. um, Oscar Grant. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have a, a great Sorry, movie, okay. Fruitvale, about Oscar Grant, the young black man who was shot in um, Oakland by the Oakland uh, Transit Police. And the officer said he was trying to stun him, and he shot him in the head by accident. Uh, no jail time. Um, nothing, and this happened in 2010. Um, were these spectacles positive or negative, and, and why, in terms of the contemporary context? And then, I'm, and then we're going to open it up. Okay, so I guess that leaves me. Yes, that's you. Kat. Yes. <laughs> well, thank thank you for your question. You know, I so I thought uh, a lot about this, and you know, glad you sort of talked about. Orange is the New Black. I don't know if, if we talked about this ever, but I actually volunteered in, in a women's prison in Pennsylvania at the State Correctional Institution, um, SCI Muncie, in, um, I think it was about 1995, just for a semester. So that's when I kind of saw firsthand how disproportionately represented um, black women were, and also how many were sort of concentrated in certain, from coming from certain communities, right? This sort of epidemic of what people call these million dollar blocks now um, in some of these uh, spaces, I'm sorry. But at any rate, I think in terms of, so on the federal level, things to do to begin to reduce that, you know, some of the ways that these states, you know, there was all this sort of federal funding to give people incentives to get tougher on crime and have longer sentences and all these things. I think that there needs to be sort of a re kind of configuration of federal funding to sort of give people some of that emphasis to de-emphasize sort of mass incarceration and try to work with folks to find alternative sources, right? Certainly to get a lot of folks treatment for, for substance abuse, but also I think that we have to deal with poverty in real ways. And that's gonna happen on certainly sort of on federal, but also on state level. But in terms of in the state, I also think, and this for me would be both sort of state and federal. We need to really, and I, I think I take your point about the role of policing, Brandon, is that we need to really kind of revisit what what do we want from sort of these civil servants really, right? Is it to protect and serve? And if so, like who, right? Which people, which bodies are getting protected and served by the law enforcement that we have now? 
And if it's going wrong, in what ways can we sort of work on changing that? I mean, I see some of these initiatives where you have now like citizens groups and the police sort of is working together. I think that's a start. But for me, I also think that when we do have clear and compelling evidence of police brutality and homicides, that they need to be prosecuted and charged mm -hmm. and go to jail. Um, not, you know, have a, um, a grand jury process that ends up with these folks not being indicted and then victims' families just go and get a payoff and that's it. Uh, I think that has to change also because those messages about sort of policing and value need to come from a variety of spaces. Um, and then I guess with respect to the local level, again, I think it is a both end, right? That we need to look at some of these long-term causes of, with respect to poverty and joblessness in, in a lot of these areas, especially where black women in particular are concentrated. One of the things that's been really hard to sort of grapple and struggle with, and I'm actually looking for all the policy analysts in the room to kind of educate me on it, it has to do with sort of the persistently high unemployment rate among black women, right? That black women are among the most impoverished in this society and this economic recovery, we're the group that got left behind. And so I think that that is also related to these issues and that I'm interested in kind of hearing about what sorts of ways that these can do to begin to arrest and address that. Um, just really, really quickly. Um, so when I talk about the civil rights movement, you know, again, part of the, f the framework that I'm using is that what kinds of reimaginings of citizenship do these movements authorize? Uh, and what kinds of imaginings of citizenship do they challenge? One of the things that we've talked a lot about in the discourse on Black Lives Matter, which is incredibly important, is that they've challenged the kind of notion that um, only a certain type of black citizen subject deserves standing, and that's not one that's a uh, poor black woman, it's not one that's queer identified. Um, and, and, and what this movement has done a lot to do is put people uh, who have always been on the margins of, of black freedom struggles at the center and try to, to, to uh, pierce through the kinds of politics of misrecognition that, that diminish their civic standing. Um, one of the things I think they, they've done but has not gotten the same sort of attention is that they're really challenging a very pernicious thing that, that is mostly built on um, stigmas and stereotypes about black women, but also uh, uh, does um, you know, have some, some valence for black men, is this idea that the appropriate way to view black citizens, particularly poor black citizens, as, is as, as parasitic mm -hmm. or in, a, in some sort of debt relation to the rest of the polity. Mm -hmm. And you gotta really think critically about that. Like part of what everything that's going on right now is that the citizenship relations in all, all around the world, in advanced capitalist societies, are being undermined and turned into debtor relationships. Like debt is starting to be, or it's already a lot of places, the, the main way for, for people to um, understand their economic relationships, their political relationships, governing practices, uh, practices of relation to each other, education. Um, and in Ferguson and DC and places like that, they, that's what's undermined the citizenship relation. The Washington Post just did an amazing story on um, the tax collection that DC does has been outsourced to private companies, mm -hmm. which then go after people who are uh, one month or two months delinquent on their tax bills. Often these people are in hospice care or hospital care, they're elderly citizens who owe maybe $100. One person got their entire home taken for a $37 tax bill. Right? So these are forms of expropriation that, that, that people are using to gain wealth by turning the relationship between the citizenry into a debtor relationship. So that's one thing I think they are challenging, particularly in Ferguson uh, and St. Louis County. One of the reasons that other places are not doing it are, is the class dynamics that I talked about. Right? If you've got a middle class leadership that's not susceptible to these kinds of things, and they're not really organizing in these communities asking people what they want, that they're sort of content with the, the, the narrative of shared vulnerability to police uh, profiling and police shooting, it's very hard to go just from that shared vulnerability to a much deeper structural analysis of political economy and governance. It's not impossible, but it's very difficult. 
You really do have to organize in communities and ask people what they want. And this is how I end up, and, and the last thing I'll talk about is the policy proposals. Um, one group that I think is, is really important to look at for those of you who are interested in, in policy is Campaign Zero. Um, but just generally, this question about what are the police for, what do they do, is, is one that, that, that Black Lives Matter has opened up. And I really want to take it seriously as an imaginative question, because if you go into a lot of low-income black communities that are plagued with violence, right, they understand that the solution to violence isn't just locking up as many people as possible and shooting police, uh, I mean, letting police shoot as many people as they want, but they also want a solution to violence, right? Uh, and so we, we need to think about really creative ways to tackling that problem. One is to have a long-term structural conception of what creates violence. Right? So one of the things we're learning in sociology and public health is how important lead and toxins are in, in, in harming people and making it harder for people to, um, to, to have impulse control in, 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 uh, in situations that might lead to violence. Uh, we, we learn about mental health, right? Like why is it that we don't have mental health units embedded in police departments that can respond specifically to these kinds of incidents when people notice them, right? Um, the questions about you know, foregrounding gender and feminism in, in our analysis of how do we deal with intimate partner violence, right? So that black women aren't being sent to jail for calling the police on uh, their intimate partners, right? Because, oh, this guy wasn't on the lease. Like, that's one of the things that happened in Ferguson. They called the police. The guy, the police shows up, and he's like, hey, this guy's not on the lease. You're going to jail, too, for violating the lease arrangement. So, because we're going to get money out of you. I mean, that's crazy. That's not what the police are for. And the last thing I'll say is, and I'll leave this alone, is when Barack Obama said the police acted stupidly after Henry Louis Gates got arrested, I think that's the thing that he should have never backed away from. Because there is such a thing as the police acting stupidly. And if we can't have a conversation about what's a good arrest and what's a bad arrest, then we are lost from the door. So um, you asked me the question about um, whether or not the postcards and even the videos that we're seeing now, um, is that also a public spectacle? And I th Because some, is my mic not on? Oh, we needed to see some of it because people didn't believe it was happening. Right. Um, we just talked about this in my class this morning. They were, some of the students were saying, like, if it wasn't for the video, we wouldn't believe the severity of this, these, type, these types of crimes. So there is, some of that is good because you're seeing these, like, you know, a police officer's report, which is a historical document, right, compared to a video of him moving a taser. That does, that's not written in the port, report that way. So you're seeing some discrepancies in what the reports are saying and what actually happened because we have the video. So on some, in some cases, I think it's important, but I, I guess my issue is showing them over and over and over again. Now, like, we know this happened. We know some of these cases happened. Do we have to show all of them? Do we have to loop it around so when the reporting on updates about the story, you know, two weeks after it happened or two weeks after the first video, do we need to keep seeing it? It reminds me of, um, I was in LA in grad school when the Rodney King riots happened. And um, they showed, I don't know if anyone's heard of Latasha Harlins. Um, you know, she gets sh murdered, um, literally, and they showed it on the news the first, like, maybe two nights. And I, I remember saying this, that this was the first time that I realized that when I watch movies and I see people that are killed in, 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 in theater productions, they actually fall kind of slow. But when I saw the, Natasha Harlins get shot for the first time, seeing somebody get shot, she hit the ground so fast, I couldn't even blink my eye, and she was already out of the, out of the shot. And that's when I realized, like, they, they pulled it after that. And that's when I realized that every other time that I've seen, like, stuff on television or, or movies, it's not as authentic. And so my, uh, my idea about this, about it being the negative aspect, is that it becomes a spectacle. And, and we, so we're watching it over and over again. I think we, it, some of it's necessary, but not to the, ex to the extent where it continues. I don't think it's the same as um, lynching postcards, um, but I do think that the media is, is playing against that and using those, those videos. Um, and also, it's against the will of the family. I mean, if you look at most of these cases, the, the parents or the other surviving relatives ask for this material not to be shown. So they don't even have a right to the body of their own child. But so what's the purpose of it being on television then? You know, that, that to me is a very disrespectful way, a disrespectful way to, to, to allow your child, like you're not even giving them the, the grace and the space to mourn. 
Um, and now it's becoming this spectacle. Now their child's death video photos of them. I mean, Michael Brown laid in the street for more than four hours, and I saw footage of blood, like a stream of blood that went from here to that chair. Like, you can look it up online. It's there still. And I, I can't imagine being his parents. So how would I feel that my child is being remembered by his dead, you know, swollen body on the ground four hours after he died? So I, that's the part of it that bothers me. Some mics. Questions? Harvey Berg. Um, what role uh, do you think the press should play as opposed to the role that they do play, and how can that be used to benefit the movements if done correctly? That's a very good question. Um, it's going to be, it's going to sound idealistic, but accurate reporting from multiple perspectives, not a, a particular story that's being told from one perspective. Um, I think that, you know, when I look at, we're looking at um, old newspapers here in Texas, and my students and I laugh because the newspapers during slavery have everything from like the National Enquirer type news to a court case and the, the, the transcript of that court case to political events. I'm not suggesting that that's what we see, but I, I would like to see a little bit more balanced or multiple perspectives. Um, and I, I think that we need to, to sort of check the idea of, um, how do I say this, um, sensationalizing the, the, the stories. And that's what we see. There's, that's what we, we're seeing a little bit too much of that, from my, in my opinion. I don't know if other panelists have. I just want to say one thing. I, mean, I, I appreciate that question, too. It's something that I wrestle with a lot between sort of on one hand recognizing the power that that lens has in terms of sort of waking up a public and getting people mobilized to action, but also in the ways that that has been really harmful for certain kinds of victims, right, the bodies that don't matter. So for me, one of the frustrations over this past year was the Daniel Holtz Claw case. And, and have, you know, knowing for you know, over a year that there was this case where there were at least 13 black women who had been assaulted by this police officer, and that he was going on trial, and that even when they actually seated an all-white jury, that it still wasn't national news until he got convicted. Right, like that was the story. It wasn't that, oh, there are all these black women who have been raped and brutalized by this police officer. It was a ripple only that there's an all white jury adjudicating a case with these kinds of racial dimensions. But right, that someone was convicted and this guy cried. This was what made national media. Then we saw the victims for a heartbeat and then it was gone. So I, you know, I, I'm frustrated with it at points also, but I do think that it, it plays a role. Um, it's a necessary evil, but how to get it to be more equitable, I, I'm still at a loss. And I think these concerns are really like related to the political question, which is mm -hmm. that if, if your movement is, is dependent, right, so if, if the only time the media will pay attention mm -hmm. is a gruesome spectacle of death, mm -hmm. right, how can you render visible something like what happened in the Holtz Claw case, to, to organize people and, and to draw attention to that. that that's a real problem mm -hmm. that you've got to think through because the other problem with relying on spectacle of death is that you exhaust the spectacle, yeah. Yeah. right? So the, 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 the logic of spectacle is that you don't care anymore. Right. I mean, there's a great piece a couple months ago about the circus, mm -hmm. right? It sounds off topic, but it's, it's important because they're like, kids mm -hmm. don't want to go to the circus anymore because the kinds of spectacles they have at the circus are not impressive to them, mm -hmm. right? They see CGI animals doing things far beyond mm -hmm. what these animals do in real mm -hmm. life. They see people in their movies flying through the air, flipping mm -hmm. and doing things that no person could ever do, so that when you see it in real life, it doesn't mean mm -hmm. anything to them. And the circus is shutting down in part because that spectacle has exhausted itself. It's been transcended. And the same thing mm -hmm. happens in politics. You can become numb. Yeah to the incessant repetition of black death. Oh, they got another one, mm -hmm. you know. People start forgetting the names. Right. I mean, there's too many names. People start, they forgot. It was Trayvon Martin at first, but then 
as the names kept growing, people were, oh, well, the guy, we started recognizing them by the city. Right. Oh, the guy in North Charleston. Oh, the person, you know. Right. So it became the city. So then there goes the person. Questions? Questions? We got one right there. Can you identify yourself, please? Sure. My name is Victoria Berryhill, and I work for the Safe Alliance. It's an organization here in town um, aimed at ending sexual assault, domestic violence, and child abuse and neglect. So does the transformation of it being about this individual person to being about the city not in and of itself serve as that same spectacle? I don't think so. Um, if it if it highlights other issues, like I think what happened in Ferguson, it highlights other issues, and then there was an investigation and major changes after that. Um, I don't know that I don't know that the city becomes um, a spectacle. I think Baltimore did for a while because they were, but they were still writing. So if you're focusing on the message, it depends on how you're looking at the at the um, at the events and how they unfold. But I think that my issue was more about the body and the individual. Um, and I don't want that to get lost, that this is a person who has you know, a family, and the family didn't necessarily want this to happen this way. Um, and so that's, part of my, one of, that's one of my major issues with this. Well, she's get, getting there. I think one, one of the major things you guys are talking about, and this is what um, Brandon was saying vis-a-vis -vis the Oscars So White campaign, is that um, it's bigger than that in terms of the media. A lot of this is structures that we were talking about um, in the 60s and where are, you know, where, where are um, black women who are heading media companies or, or at NBC, at K and where, where are the producers and the editors and where, where are um, the people who have that perspective that these lives matter and these people um, matter? And I think that's still, we still have a big, big, uh, it's a source problem more so than just saying um, it's, it's the, it, it's sort of the media is racist. Yes, it's racist, but there's no, it's like, you know, there's no black person who can green light a film in Hollywood. I mean, people say Tyler Perry to do his Tyler Perry stuff. But um, there's no, and that's part of the Oscar problem, um, but that's usually structural. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Amanda Woog. Um, I'm with the Institute for Urban Policy Research and Analysis here at UT. Um, my question has to do with a theme that I've kind of heard throughout comments, which is the role of bodies and the role of power and oppression on bodies, in particular black bodies, um, how they're destroyed, exploited, controlled. And it reminds me of the reproductive justice movement in some ways, um, how uh, patriarchy and how white supremacy um, works to control women's bodies. And of course, we see um, the intersection of reproductive justice and racial justice throughout history um, from uh, forced sterilization, criminalization of pregnant, pregnant women who use drugs, um, so my question is, how can um, the racial justice and the reproductive justice movement, which has kind of seen a resurgence recently with this um, pending decision in the Supreme Court and these laws that you know Texas in particular and states nationwide have been enacting to um, reduce access to abortion and kind of generally control women's bodies. We saw the CDC form that came out last week about um, how pregnant and non-pregnant women should drink or not drink alcohol. Um, so how can these movements, wh wh what do you see as the overlap in these movements and the goals? How can they work together on a grassroots and on a political level? You want to take a stab? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I should, I should say one thing is that, um, you know, and a big emphasis in my remarks is, is is in part that um, you know these things have a logic that that that's that are rooted in, I think, principally two different forces. One is the sort of stigmatization of populations, particularly black populations, black women, right, as being irresponsible, uh, parasitic, uh, you know, on on the body politic, on the legitimate body politic. And the kinds of neoliberal public policy reforms that are evacuating the public and destroying the very idea of the public, 
right? So that public health stops being a responsibility for the public, right? Um, for the government to, to, to participate in. And if you allow the stigma to justify this evisceration of, of the public, uh, then you're, those things are gonna come down the pipe for the entire citizenry, right? That, that it's not just gonna stop at um, the kind of coercive practices for black women's reproduction that we see in inner city neighborhoods. Those things are already spilling out all across the United States um, as the logic plays itself out because you're destroying the very uh, foundational possibilities for something like reproductive justice and public health to exist. So I, that's where I think they, they come together. And if, and if people aren't supportive of these movements and they think, oh, this is just a race thing and that's, that has nothing to do with my general concerns about social justice and the very possibility for justice, then again, I think you're, you're, you're setting yourself up for the, the um, destruction of your own citizen uh, uh, civic standing. Great question, Amanda, by the way. Uh, <laughs> so I actually think that the, the way to make, perhaps have these two sort of social movements meet is by broadening or running it out. So when we think about reproductive justice, not just with sort of access to abortion, because I think, listen, there are a lot of constituencies within sort of the black community that aren't necessarily for, you know, who don't necessarily oppose some of the limitations that are put on sort of these issues around choice. So there's, there's one thing, right, that there's not sort of a monolithic kind of community with res response to that. Um, in quite the same way as I think there is with sort of like some of these instances of police brutality. But I do think there's, a, there's potential for coalition building if we sort of pair that with overall access to sort of reproductive justice. So in terms of having better health outcomes for black women writ large, in terms of having better access to prenatal care, um, and you know, and ensuring that you have sort of you know even birth choices, right? In terms of how you want to deliver and where, I think that if it gets paired with that, as well as sort of the right to decide if you want to terminate a pregnancy uh, or not, that that could well be a way to begin to start that dialogue. Because I think people understand the broader implications about reproductive justice with respect to those issues around choice. Um, broadly, not just to terminate, but also if they do want to actually carry and deliver and have these other better outcomes. Thanks. Uh, Bob Wilson, the LBJ School. A terrific set of presentations, really uh, very enlightening. The historical analysis, I think, is really important. One element that is important when you get around to public policy is to have the history and the facts, the cases, mm -hmm. documented. Uh, and I think uh, your work falls into that line. I would look, like to look for a few minutes to the other side, to a, another side of uh, the public policy issue, and that is the performance of government. We've, in one way, you've been talking about that, the killing of people that's government not acting well, outrageous. People are outraged, but I'd like to change the focus a little bit. We heard earlier today that in some respects, Barack Obama's uh, presidency has uh, not met expectations. I'm curious about your thoughts on the Department of Justice and kind of its role. Uh, my sense is, when, from what I've seen, that Eric Colder in the Justice Department has really been good on these issues. They don't have as much leverage as you would like, but that's kind of one question. Um, the, the performance of the Department of Justice. And then the second is, uh, how do we get criminal justice systems to change or police departments to change? And so the leadership in these big institutions, the training that people get, uh, we have elected officials that may be minorities, why don't they just put in good police commissioners? Uh, a little kind of reflection on that, because the social movement's going to have to engage with someone. Who is that someone? Is it? pressure on the Department of Justice, is the press pressure on local officials. So I'd like to talk about kind of the public sector side of that, if you would, please. I think that um, overall, speaking generally, I think the Department of Justice has been pretty involved and on in, in a level that we haven't seen in other cases. Um, 
was thinking, you know, comparing this to Hurricane Katrina, look at the difference in the response to Ferguson, even though there's, there's you know, questions about that, but response to Ferguson versus Katrina. And I think that's one example of how things have changed. You know, Holder going in physically, going to some of these places, talking to people, sitting down. Um, I think that shows a different level of effort um, and a, and a more, um, more robust level than we've seen in the past. Um, I think, though, to answer your question about how do we move from the spectacle to, to examining and, and solving some of these problems, I think one is it's about educating people, educating the police force. Um, I think, I, I hate to say like the whole diversity training thing, but I think that there is something about having an awareness of understanding that there's a, a history rooted in it. You know, the police force started out as slave patrols, you know, and if you understand that foundation, you know, then you can move forward and at least understand where you are and what does it mean when you, you, you meet somebody on the street you know, today and if there's some, a hostility or animosity you know, from the moment that you interact with that person, understand the foundation of that, of that anger. So I think part of it is some, some public dialogues, um, some, some research policy briefs that we're talking about, uh, reports. I think these reports are very helpful, but we also need to know the background and the history that led up to these, these events and hopefully not just these individuals, but then having some conversation. I mean, that's, that's what we're doing in my classroom. I mean, a lot of times the students are saying that they didn't know these histories. They, didn't, they were not aware of a lot of this. And we looked at like from origin all the way forward up until today. How does that change the way we understand not only American history, but public policy? So I think it's, it's about having conversations and having people in there that are being trained that understand the neighborhood, you know, the history of the neighborhood, how the neighborhood's changed. Uh, and moving on out to the city level and even the state level. Um, I think uh, you know, two 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 questions are really really important. Um, with the justice department, you know, there are things that that they're doing incredibly well um, it's in terms of like practical utilitarian outcomes. Right, they're investigating more discrimination cases. Uh, they've got dozens of police departments under review. Uh, the, the move into Ferguson was, was relatively decisive, particularly in the history of the Justice Department. Uh, but to me, what that all poses is a much more complicated philosophical question about how should we understand public policy and political action around racial injustice in the 21st century. Because Barack Obama's administration is a really decisive challenge to most of the black political tradition on how to think about this. Um, most of the black political tradition, including Black Lives Matter, says we should, you know, this should be a public conversation. We should be making claims to the public and trying to persuade certain people, um, uh, bringing to light these issues of, uh, through, through vigorous forms of contestation. And the challenge from the Obama administration is to say all of the political science and sociology data and psychology data suggests that anything the president endorses, despite, I mean, whether it's Barack Obama or not, immediately polarizes the public in this political atmosphere. With Barack Obama, that has become even more racialized than it usually is, and that him endorsing almost anything publicly, right, just causes a backlash. Mm -hmm. And that happens, that trickles down to activists as well. Like when you, when you give uh, white Americans a prompt about the death penalty being racist, uh, they actually, it actually increases support for the death penalty than when you do not give them that prompt. Um, yeah, so that's, that's why it's not easy to dismiss the Obama administration who says, well, look, in this kind of context, the best thing you can do is use the Democratic Party to capture the machinery of government and funnel everything through executive branch actions. Justice Department, uh, Agricultural Bureau did the reparations for black farmers. Uh, the housing and urban development, people have done the affirmatively furthering fair housing rule, which has put municipalities under the most strict guidelines for integration that we've seen since the 60s. Um, now, all that stuff's really fragile, because if you lose a presidency, you don't have that anymore. Mm -hmm. There's no public justification for it, so people don't even know that it's happening. I mean, I'm sure many of you, this is the first time you've ever heard of any of those things. Uh, that's a complicated way, and it's not clear to me what's the right answer, but I do think it's a really decisive challenge of how to, to go about this question. And on the police thing, just very, very quickly, I think, you know, one of the things you have to, to do is to, to find some way around the political machinations of the police unions. Mm. Um, because they are holding municipalities hostage on the question of crime. 
right? In a city like Baltimore, Detroit, these people get voted in or out of office based on the murder rate. And if they can withdraw their investigations, withdraw resources, and allow murder rate to fluctuate, the, the crime rate to fluctuate, then these mayors can't do anything to them. Uh, there has to be political solutions that are pushed by social movements and other actors that are sympathetic to them to try to solve these crime problems without the really punitive apparatus. If nothing else is on the table, that's what people will turn to. They're, they're basically holding that over everyone's head. And I really, really think that's where a lot of energy needs to go um, because we have other things that can deal with these questions besides incarceration. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're just not getting the kind of fair hearing and, and, and really long leash of experimentation um, given the aggressive uh, reaction by police unions and their, and their allies. Thank you. Thank you.